when I was preparing my slides, uh, my first slide looked like this. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's the good news right away, so let's just get that out of the way. Well, that didn't exactly happen, as we know, and I was shocked. I mean, I was shocked about the course American politics is taking, but I was also shocked because I'm doing election forecasting. And together with three American colleagues, uh, we are running this website called the Polyvote, where we are predicting the outcome of this election. And we expected that Hillary Clinton would win the popular vote, which she ended up winning, and we were within the margin of error, but who cares, right? Uh, we predicted her to also win the Electoral College, and that's how Americans decide who their president is. And that was actually a very, uh, well, humbling experience, uh, and it was a big mistake. But we weren't the only ones. Uh, pretty much everyone who was doing Electoral College predictions got it wrong. Now, to be fair, some were a little bit more conservative on Clinton's chances than others, but the consensus really was that she is going to win this. And even people in the Trump campaign didn't have a clue that they really have a chance at this. So the question really is, what went wrong with the predictions? Now, many people now blame the polls. But actually, if you look at the national polls, for example, they were pretty good. The error was actually lower than it was in 2012, but nobody paid attention because it didn't matter. The problem this year was that we had large error in some states that ended up being decisive for the outcome of this election, particularly Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Now, to be honest, it's still too early to say what exactly went wrong. We know that polls, doing polls is difficult. It's harder and harder to reach people, it's harder and harder to get people to respond to polls in the first place. And you really have a problem if certain demographic groups that tend maybe towards a certain candidate don't respond to polls at all. Now, it looks like this is what kind of happened. It's when you don't have a representative sample, it's really hard to model the electorate. And what we think what happened is that the pollsters underestimated the turnout for Trump, from white voters with other college education, and on the other hand, overestimated Clinton's support uh, among different demographic groups. And there was also big uncertainty about the share of un undecided voters who appeared to have broken towards Donald Trump very late in the campaign. But it wasn't just the polls. And I think we can learn a lot by looking at other forecasts and how they failed to learn about what we didn't understand about this election. So I've been involved in election forecasting for almost eight years now. I was a visiting scholar at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, where I worked with Scott Armstrong, who is um, one of the leading for, uh, researchers in, in forecasting. And he got me involved in the Polyvote project. And the idea of this project was to use findings from forecasting research and apply them to election forecasting and demonstrate that they work. Because what we do, you can use it for other problems as well. So one major finding in forecasting research over the last 50 years is actually to not put too much faith in any single forecast. Instead, what you should do is you should combine forecasts from many different sources, different methods that use different information. And that is the principle that we rely upon in the polyvote. Now, how can we predict elections? Probably most of you now think, well, election forecasting, that's, that's polling, right? And by the way, we are not pollsters. There's many more methods, some of which are older than polling. So before the days of polling, people would rely on other people's expectations. And that's what we do as well. So we reach out to experts and ask them, it's political scientists across the country, and we ask them to provide us with forecasts of the election outcome. And you would think that experts have knowledge about how to read polls, they know that polls have errors, but they should be able to kind of tell you in which direction the error is and move the forecast into the right direction. Now, this hasn't really happened in 2016. The chart that you see up there shows you the error of the experts in historical elections on the left and in this election on the right. And it shows you that in this election the error was much higher. And what happened is, is that the expert actually thought that the polls are underestimating Clinton. Now, this might sound crazy now, but there was lots of talk about, you know, good early voting numbers for Clinton, uh, that Trump didn't really have a turnout game or a good ground game. Uh, so you could find all these pieces of evidence. 
But there was also evidence to the contrary, such as large share of undecided voters, lots of uncertainty. It looks like there might have been some wishful thinking going on by the experts who tend to be more liberal, and maybe they just wanted their forecast to be true, and therefore focused on information that they supported it. Another method that we use are so-called prediction markets. On these markets, people bet on the outcome of the election, so there's real money at stake. This has a very long history. It goes back to the 19th century in the United States. It has a very good track record. In this election, the prediction markets were really far off, as you can see in the chart. The error was about five times higher than it used to be in previous elections. Now, the question is, why is that? We still have to analyze, but it looks a lot that it depends on who participates in these markets. We know from prior research that that's people who tend to be highly educated, they tend to be wealthy, they tend to be politically uh, engaged and, and interested. So it's a very special group of the demographic group. It's a more elite group of society. And it, to me, this kind of shows that these people, they just couldn't imagine that other, so many people would vote for Donald Trump. So they dramatically overestimated uh, Clinton's vote share. It kind of shows us also a little bit about the depolarization in the country. The next method is my favorite method because it's so simple. Instead of asking people, who are you going to vote for? Ask them, who is going to win? This question has existed since the 1930s, but it's often overlooked. This is the most accurate method that we have to predict election outcomes. Unfortunately, it's not asked that often in polls, and we only have data for the national level. It would have been good to see this uh, for some really critical st swing states, what the voters would have think, thought in states such as Pennsylvania. And then, of course, in the 1930s, uh, we saw the rise of scientific polling. And polls have error. We knew that. Polls had big errors, like this one in 1948. Uh, the 2016 uh, error will be big in some states. But there has also been some excellent work on how to improve upon the accuracy of polls, which is by, again, combining, combining forecasts. So we can reduce the error of polls, and these methods do work really well. Another group of methods that we use are so-called political economy models. These models are based on the idea that voting is retrospective. So voters look back, they look at, well, how well has the president done his job, um, in particular in handling the economy, so they, they use economic indicators. And they also lose, use factors such as uh, the electoral cycle, because we know from history that Americans, after a while, they want change in who is leading their government. And if you use these factors, you can make a prediction about uh, future elections. And ironically, this method provided the most accurate predictions in this election. And I'm saying ironically because, first of all, it doesn't have a very great track record. And second of all, many of these models assume that the candidates play no role for the outcome of the election, which is completely counterintuitive uh, when you look at how candidate-focused this election was. And then the final group of methods that we have, in contrast, look specifically about what impact do campaigns have on the election outcome. So they try to measure, for example, how voters perceive the candidates on handling the issues facing the country. These models, again, failed badly, uh, and they overestimated Clinton, which she was favored in many issues, which might also tell us something about maybe a lack of media coverage about which issues are really important and who might be a better candidate to solve them. So what we know from prior research in forecasting, from elections, but also in other fields, is that the accuracy of different methods varies a lot over time. And we see it again in 2016. Methods that have worked well in the past don't necessarily work well in the future. We saw that with prediction markets this time, and we see it with political economy models as well, who did not do well in previous elections, but really have done well uh, now. Well, what does this mean? The point is that it's really difficult to predict which method will be the most accurate for predicting a particular event. If you would have asked me before the election which method is most likely wrong, I would have probably picked political economy models, simply because not a good track record and assume that candidates don't really play a role. So it's not really the conditions under which you would assume this method to work. I would have been proved really wrong. And that's, of course, 
the reason why the principle of combining works. Because if you use all this information that's out there and you put it into one forecast, you usually have the effect that you use more information. And second of all, usually the error of the different methods cancel out because usually methods have errors but in different directions. Now the problem this year was that most of these methods had the same error in the same direction. Most of the methods overestimated Clinton's share and many of the methods overestimated it by a lot. And this is, of course, a situation when combining cannot work as well. It still does as well as the typical forecast, and it prevents you from making really large errors by picking a poor prediction, but it cannot be as good as the best forecast. But that's not what combining forecast claims. The claim is that if you do it over and over again, not just for one election, over and over again, you will have the effect because all the other methods vary in their accuracy, that you will get a really accurate prediction. And again, it protects you from large errors. And I think another big benefit is, because we aggregate all this information, we really have it in front of us. And I think that's the biggest puzzle about this election, that the experts and the betting markets, which are also self-selected experts, they bet money on their information. They really missed what's going on. And some of the information was there. So I think it's not really an, a, a lack of polling accuracy this time. It was really a failure of pundits and maybe also the media. Because the media, there were models that, that say, like, look, the electoral cycle is important. Look, the economy is an important factor. Look, there's lots of undecided voters. That could have been um, an important factor to point out, and it hadn't happened. So Niels Bohr once famously said, Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> Forecasting is not an exact science. They will, we will get better, and I think the 2016 failure will ignite a lot of new research. We're already thinking about what we can do better, of course. We're thinking about how to maybe combine our forecasts in a different way, or how to challenge experts that they also can kind of consider contradictory information. And I know there's a lot of work now in the polling industry to really figure out uh, what happened and how to improve. But there will always be a random component of error. And maybe the FBI letter about Clinton's emails was some sort of random October surprise that really had an effect on the outcome of the election. We don't know. But the point is, don't take the forecasts too seriously. Don't, don't take them for granted. Don't take them as an insurance not to go to vote or as an excuse not to go to vote. Don't rely on us to predict the future, but rather shape the future by going out and vote. Thank you. <laughs>